Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you all again for joining us for our monthly international COVID-19 HPC Knowledge Exchange. Uh, my name is Sean Brown. I'm the director of the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center, and I'm also a representative of the, the uh, NSF-funded Exceed project in the United States, which is uh, helping to uh, sponsor this effort. I uh, will turn it over to my counterpart in uh, Prace, Matei, to uh, introduce himself. Hello, everybody. So uh, I'm Matej Prapodnik. Uh, I'm head of uh, Laboratory of Molecular Modeling at the National Institute of Chemistry in Ljubljana. I'm also uh, professor of physics at the University of Ljubljana. And I am current chair of uh, PRACE uh, Scientific Steering Committee, which is the counterpart of Exceed, as Sean just said, yeah. mm -hmm. on the other side of the pond. So I welcome you to this webinar. And I, I think that we, today we have uh, very nice updates. Mm -hmm. Summer is over. <laughs> and I see that we have been, uh, that we are fortunate to have the, the principal investigator of the XE project uh, with us today, John Towns. John, do you want to say a few words? Sure, I'll just say hi to everybody. Um, I would really like this series of, of, uh, of updates and discussions. I think it's been a little unusual in, in, in academic terms in many ways. So. Uh, and I look forward to hearing the updates. I think I may have heard from uh, Eve recently during uh, the, the webinar we did as part of the consortium. Um, I think that's a lot of very, very good work going on there. So I think everybody will appreciate hearing uh, what Eve has to say. Um, but uh, I, I really look, I, I look forward to the other presentations as well. I'm very happy to see this moving forward. Um, I think it's been a really nice thing to, to have come out of this. Great, Thank, thanks, John. Uh, and thanks for the support. Um, uh, just to let you know what the purpose of this is for the new the newcomers, we, we organized this webinar series and the uh, information uh, exchange to foster collaboration between uh, researchers around the world doing COVID-19 research with high performance computing uh, so that we can learn from each other, share ideas and, and exchange uh, results. And that's sort of the, the purpose of why we're here is to just to get together and, and present what the work, ongoing work that's been uh, occurring for covid um, uh, 19 research and I, it looks like we're in it for the long haul. So uh, uh, we'll probably be having these for a long, long time, but it's, it's always enjoyable to see all the beautiful research that's being um, done in, in efforts to fight this disease uh, in, internationally. So it's, a, it's always a pleasure to have this uh, webinar and thank you for joining us. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with the presentations. Uh, our first uh, update is from uh, Eve Wortelli. I think I said the last name correct. I was for a long time saying Wortel, but that's probably because I was from Montreal, my French it's, language influence. It's uh, Wortel. So I'll turn it over to you, Eve. You have uh, the ability to share the screen if you'd like. Right, okay, let's see. I share screen. Um, PowerPoint. Come on. And, okay, the, do you guys see that? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the role of ancestry in COVID-19 infection. And um, I want to thank all my, my collaborators, Erminder, who's my graduate student, and uh, Kyle at University of Chicago, and Bruce at uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And also, I'm really grateful to Sean and Tom and Roberto for all the help that they give us, especially Sean has been doing, like, working with us so nicely. Thank you. Um, and then, um, and then, uh, so we're working a lot with this team called Covert, which Bruce and Kyle are members of. And this is a different type of team than, than the one that we're in now. It's basically a multidisciplinary team of COVID researchers. And um, any of you guys can join it if you're interested. And the cool thing about it is, is it's got people um, that are clinicians and and uh, cell biologists and you know, bioinformaticists, a whole range of different areas. And so if you're working on some kind of a, of a high, high power computational project, you can find somebody, if you can interest them, they'll actually test it out in the lab. So I actually, and, it, and they know all the stuff about human biology, so it's really cool to work with them. So just, I recommend it to anybody that is interested in getting some of their ideas tested out. Oops, okay, here we go. Um, so uh, our project is really focused uh, predominantly on orphan genes, which are genes that are 
are novel. They have no detectable protein homolog in any other species, and um, they're referred to as orphan genes. And um, they're very under-identified because they have no they have no protein homolog. They don't really have any clear characteristics, and uh, some of them have been identified in every species, but we, we believe many of them haven't. And people are constantly identifying new ones, finding a new gene that's an orphan. Um, so these genes evolve in response to um, environmental shifts, and they're constantly evolving. An organism is constantly being exposed to new environment. And a corollary of this is that genes in an organism will have different ages. Some of them will have evolved um, back in the prokaryotic days when everything was prokaryotic a you know, billion or so years ago. And uh, some will be very recent. Um, a second corollary is that although orphan genes likely continually arise to, to meet environmental needs, enable an organism to survive, most of them disappear quickly as well. Uh, so only a few of them get retained. And if, if this wasn't the case, we'd end up with genes having millions, uh, organisms having millions of genes in, instead of the maybe 25 to 50,000 genes that, that we see now. Um, so so uh, they, they have an outside role, outsized role in species specific traits, maybe uh, about Five or 600 have been characterized to date. I'll just give you one example, which is uh, jellyfish toxins. And when I say it with a plural, it's because it is a plural. So people identified a number, by looking at the protein, identified a number of proteins that, that the jellyfish produced as toxins. And then once sequencing came in, people started to realize, hey, these are really different among jellyfish species. And some of them are indeed orphan genes that have evolved newly. And it's this constant prey predator competition. Uh, a little jellyfish is all gooey and really would have nothing, you know, you think of a jellyfish as scary, but it's only because it has that toxin. Otherwise it would be, you know, eaten up by all kinds of things and it wouldn't be able to catch anything. So these, it, these, these having a unique protein that'll bind with the prey's receptor is totally um, necessary to jellyfish survival. So they're always evolving new ones to compete with the predators, which are all, always evolving new receptors. That's just one of like 500 examples. And in, um, in a whole variety of organisms, uh, different orphan genes combat diseases and stresses, and this includes in humans as well. So our natural thought was, well, do orphan genes play a role in COVID infection? And here's a cell here. If you don't know what this is, I probably all you do. And these are the, the nasty uh, SARS virus. And um, if they do play a role in infection, um, can we use them somehow to, in COVID infection, can we use them somehow for precision therapeutics? So our hypotheses that we want to test are that novel or orphan genes will enhance our, the prognostic signature uh, for COVID and reveal new aspects of, of uh, COVID-19 biology. And our second hypothesis is that gene hype expression will vary by ancestry um, and reveal aspects of COVID-19. So the idea here is if any population of any species is growing uh, separate from some other uh, population, it'll have diverse uh, uh, development of orphan genes to combat the different, the different pre survival uh, pressures in the, in the different environments. And we know this is already true for maize. We've looked, our lab is, for example, look at it in maize and in Arabidopsis, and it's definitely the case that this occurs in those two plant species. But it makes sense it would occur in humans, and that this might also reveal some a, a better understanding of COVID. So the um, what we're looking at now is um, it, it has to do with the fact that that African Americans are disproportionately affected. Uh, I think there's something something like actually six times more deaths um, per, per population um, from COVID-19. And the disease outcomes of any disease are gonna depend on the external factors like socioeconomic for humans anyways, and environmental factors and the genetics of the organisms. And then gene expression itself is, is the interaction of the external with genetic factors. And so this interaction provides a snapshot, and RNA-seq can think of a snapshot of gene expression. And so gene expression is actually a also a combination of the disease, the factors that determine disease outcomes. 
And uh, we recently found multiple genes are differentially expressed in African Americans compared to European Americans, and other groups have uh, recently found this as well. Uh, so we're, with the pipeline that we're um, making use of the uh, Pittsburgh cluster it on is um, it is this. So we have a series of, of COVID uh, bulk RNA and single cell RNA studies. And as they released, we're feeding these into the pipeline. And we also have a set of, of, uh, of data from about 40 data uh, conditions and tissues from these large GTEx and TCGA um, human data projects. This is normal tissues and this is cancerous tissues. And we'll probably end up with about 40,000 human species. And then um, we have a, a processing pipeline. It's, I don't have the details here, but it's, it's, it's nice because it is reproducible. It identifies novel orphan genes as well as annotated genes. So it looks at all the transcripts that aligns into the genome and we get a good feeling for what the novel orphan genes are as well as but we also get the genes that are known. And our goal is to get about, uh, for every sample of maybe 40,000 or so samples, we would get um, about, we're gonna get about 50,000 transcripts per sample identified and quantified. Um, so we're in this process of doing this. And um, in, in addition, we're gathering sample metadata, the information about each sample. So for example, did the person smoke and all kinds of information like that. And um, we're also inferring the ancestry of individuals for which this is not present in the metadata. So some projects contain this information and some do not. So we're doing, for those that don't, um, we're we're getting this information as well. And then we're analyzing everything on our meta own graph software, which is freely available for anybody. And what we want is new COVID genes for experimental testing and precision medicine. So we're into this pipeline. We've done the bulk RNA um, in terms of, of uh, completing uh, the initial transcriptome assembly. And we're going through the COVID infected individuals and single cell uh, data for COVID infected individuals as well. And what we do, the one thing that we find as, a, as we're looking at the non COVID data, which is what I'm going to show you right now, um, so is that if we look at genes, uh, gene expression across the two populations, um, we find that, that differential expression of genes is enriched in terms of infection inflammation and immunity. So here's an example, the thyroid gland. And if we look at the enrichment of differentially expressed genes, regulation of T cells, killing of cells of other organisms, antimicrobial humor responses, and receptor mediated endocytosis, and all these are associated with COVID infection. And these are all upregulated in African-Americans compared to European Americans. Uh, we've also looked at the, oops, sorry at cell type specific responses. And um, so this is, it's kind of a complicated diagram here, but, but what, what, uh, what we did here was to look at, at, well, let me, sorry, I'm not, I'm trying to move my little pointer around and it's not wanting to move. Whoop. I don't know, whoop. I don't know why I can't move my pointer, but, um, so sorry, I can't move my pointer my arrow, but I'll explain it. So, so what, what this is, the, what, this is a heat map of gene expression. Uh, high expression is showed by a bright yellow color. And there is a single data from single cells. And it's, it shows the expression of, cert, of, of various genes in a variety of cell, cell types. And so there's B cells and two kinds of B cells, endothelial cells, there's four times of endothelial, two times of endothelial cells, epithelial cells. So there's a number of cells. And um, what we've shown here is the genes that are upregulated at, in African Americans versus, um, versus um, European Americans. And so if you look at the NMPs uh, and you see dendritic NMPs, you can see that these are, 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 so these dendritic cells here are upregulated in the African Americans versus the Caucasians. And if you look at the glandular cells, which are thought to be, you know, critical for an infection and the site of infection, you can see that both the duct glandular cells and the, gla the, the uh, mucus glandular cells are also upregulated in 
in um, African Americans. So it may be that the cells are more active in, in this ancestry, or it may be that there's more of these cell types because we don't really know these things, these information well. It hasn't really been looked at. Um, here's just another example. And then uh, our last example I want to show you is one gene that we've identified, which is called FAA2. It's a novel uh, gene that we, we predict affects COVID-19, um, and it's very much more highly expressed in African Americans than in European Americans. I still can't move my pointer. Oh, now I can't. Okay, so you can see, for example, this most extreme example, it's 41-fold uh, more highly expressed in African Americans than in European Americans here. So these are African Americans and these are European Americans. And this is the violin plot. So you can see it's really pretty significantly more expressed under all these conditions, actually under every condition that we've looked at. And um, this gene is involved in uh, processing of of the uh, processing and development of the uh, and in, during endocytosis and the early endosomes. And this process is basically how most COVID seems to get, we think most COVID gets into the body. And so it's, it's, um, it's a critical step. And what it does is it takes those early endosomes, a high expression of this gene, um, it binds to the early endosomes and moves them onto a different cytoskeletal tract and, um, and the actin cytos cytoskeleton and keeps them from being um, processed in the normal in the normal manner that they would, and so it it's it's an interesting uh, observation. That's just one thing that we found. There's a number of other things. And we have a paper um, which is on, on bioarchives, and I think I've shared it with the group, um, but anybody could take a look at it. Uh, and we're submitting it next week, actually. Uh, I just want to mention finally that we need better better metadata for human samples. Maybe most most of you aren't really involved in this kind of a thing, but if you ever if you ever get involved with it, one of the things that that really is lacking in our ability to under to identify um, processes that are that are important in, for example, different ethnicities or or in, or in smokers versus non-smokers, all kinds of any kind of a of a co of a covariate within a bunch of data is metadata about that. And particularly for ethnicity, um, this just isn't there. Uh, so we don't know the race of the individuals. Um, and so we're going to actually, for the most part, we're going to predict that ourselves from the RNA-seq expression data. And we also don't know anything about their socioeconomic conditions. We don't know the zip code, income, educational level, profession, any of those kinds of things, which are essential to be able to tease apart the effects of genetics from the effects of environment. And this is really critical um, to, to in, utter, in, a, in order to understand how COVID can differentially affect populations. Um, so our research is in progress. I think I've gone through all these. Uh, what, the last point that I'm making here is we're making all the data and metadata and the pipelines and the code publicly accessible as we're producing it um, via both MetaOM Graph and on GitHub. And so if you want to try anything out, you're welcome and we can help you with it. Um, and finally, our overarching aims are to comprehensively annotate or novel orphan genes in humans, and particularly in the context of COVID-19. We believe this is gonna be important for existing and emerging disease as well. And we wanna provide these data as a resource to medical researchers uh, as predictive markers, oops, predictive markers of disease susceptibility for precision medicine for different populations and um, undiscovered genes that can be experimented on directly to determine their efficacy as therapeutic agents. That's my talk. And sorry if I went, I think I went long, I'm sorry. That was great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions or comments they'd like to make? Okay, well, th thanks, uh, thanks Eve for the presentation. That was really great. Um, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to our next uh, presentation, which will be from uh, Rami Amaro. Um, I didn't have time to get everybody's credentials put into my my script, so. No credentials. Uh, if you can tell us who you are, I appreciate it. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 
I'm, I'm very. Back I'm, host, and I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's all good. So, um, hi everyone. I'm Romy. I'm a professor of chemistry and biochemistry at UC San Diego, and um, I'm going to give an update about our work in SARS-CoV-2, uh, and with the that's really relied heavily on the consortium computing that has become available. So I was trying to um, keep this to about five to ten minutes. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through this, but we can, you know, you can ask me whatever questions you want. So can, hopefully you can see uh, my presentation. Yeah, I got some nods. Good. Okay, right. So, um, so we, in my group, we're doing a lot of all atom molecular dynamic simulations on different components of the spike of, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And so just, I think probably most of the folks on this call already appreciate a lot about the structure of the virus, but just to sort of ground us in what we're doing, we are, so this is a, this is sort of a rendering of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's a lipid enveloped virus and it has these so-called spike proteins coming out of it. So it's the same protein with maybe, you know, roughly on average about 50 copies of this protein uh, on its surface sort of decorated around it. Um, and basically what we want to do is use simulations to understand the details of this molecular machine, uh, including all of the glycans and so forth that it has on it, and then try to also we really understand its dynamics. And so one of the, you know, these, these viral glycoproteins are really fascinating because they undergo um, a really huge set of conformational changes as they go through the fusion process with the host cell. And so um, what we've been really interested to do is just get a better understanding of sort of some of the initial states of what this spike protein looks like, as well as sort of its initial encounter with ACE2 um, also. So I'll tell you a little bit about the work that we've been able to do so far. Okay, so um, I think many of you know that um, what we've been doing is uh, and where these simulations are actually useful, right, is that, um, you know, we have these fantastic uh, techniques to acquire or resolve uh, biological structures. And CryoEM has given us these really wonderful views of what the spike protein looks like. Um, but they've been pretty limited in the sense that uh, because of the way that they uh, sort of refine their data, they give us, a, they can give us a picture of the, what I call the spike head, which is this part that I've outlined in yellow, um, but they typically can't, they, they typically don't resolve this sort of tether, this so-called HR2 domain that tethers the spike head to the viral membrane. And as well, there's other bits that they can't see because they're too floppy or too dynamic. And so there's missing loops and there's also missing glycans, which I'll tell you about. So what we, we've done is basically, uh, you know, we take the, the Crowleum structures and we, we were working with a few of them and we build in missing loops. And then we also, by homology modeling, build in these other missing domains. The other thing that we've added that they can't see fully in these structural experiments are the glycans. And so one of, the, again, one of the fascinating things about these spike proteins is that, uh, or viruses in general, is that they've evolved this way of masking themselves from the human immune system via something that we call the glycan shield. And so in addition to having all of the complicated residues of the protein, they also have on um, asparagines, they have these N-linked and so-called O-linked glycans on some residues where they have these sugar molecules that basically sort of extend out and give additional sort of structure and additional buffer to the actual spike protein. And so with cryo-EM, because these uh, sugars are so flexible, what they can resolve uh, structurally is basically typically the first two sugar units or the so-called glycnac. So you can see the little stub, but what they can't see are all the other complicated branches. So they, um, so we've integrated these structural sort of models that we have with this site-specific mapping of glycans that they can do by a, a glycomics. Um, and we have added those essentially to the, to the, the spike itself. We also have um, built in sort of the viral membrane, which because this guy, this, the, the virus is bud off of the endoplasmic reticulum, they, uh, the, the, the viral membrane has mostly the components of the ER. So we have a, sort of a, 
a certain percentage balance of, of lipids that's quite normally found in the ER. We have that built into the simulations. And then we also have this um, part here. Uh, this is, uh, these are these uh, palmitylated cysteines. So there's a number of cysteines that are basically have these post-translational modifications that um, essentially, this is common for these uh, viral membrane proteins, they basically sort of snorkel up into the cytoplasmic tails that sort of extend into the virus. These uh, palmitylation groups basically um, snorkel up into the membrane and keep these guys sort of footed in the in the membrane. So we have that too. So this is basically just a movie of what the full structure looks like. So we've built in all of the different domains that are there, giving us sort of a complete picture um, uh, of the virus. We, we have the we have multiple states. So in this case, we have the, the RVD up state. So this um, I'll tell you more about there's some conformational changes. And then we also have all the glycans going the full length of the protein. Again, as I mentioned, we have the membrane and the palmitylated cysteines. And then this is sort of what the full structure looks like when it's fully decorated. And then um, what we've done is we've been able to use um, Frontera to uh, sort of animate or, you know, predictively sim to simulate the atomic level dynamics using sort of very conventional all atom MD. And we get this sort of picture of how this protein is sort of moving in terms of its baseline dynamics. The system has about one in 1.5. It has 1.7 million atoms. And we have um, created different copies so, or different sort of, we have a couple different um, conformational states. So we have the so-called RBD down as well as the RBD up. So these are different states that the cryo-electron microscopists have trapped the protein in. And I'll talk a little bit about just very briefly about some of the, um, the dynamics of that. So you can see some of the stats here. For, we use the term force field. Um, we're getting about 60 nanoseconds per day on 256 nodes on TAC Frontera and uh, generated about four microseconds per system. So um, you know, at the end of the day, what this allows us to do is basically see what this glycan shield actually looks like because experimentalists can't see that. So this information is useful to folks and um, the, the dark blue, so I'm showing here the protein with light blue coloring, and then the dark blue little puffs that you see, those are composite renderings of what those sugars look like over time. And you can see that they are wiggling and moving around. So each puff ball basically corresponds to sort of one glycan. Um, and this is just looking at snapshots over the microsecond trajectories. Uh, and you can sort of see sort of how it does create this shield over the protein. One of the things that we saw was that when the RBD is in the so-called up conformation, this, this is like the, this tip up here, this little blue tip that you can see here, this is the bit that needs to make the handshake with ACE2, which is the receptor on the host cell that needs to happen for, um, for, host, for the infection to occur. And when this guy is in the up conformation, that bit, that, that sort of arrow tip is exposed versus in the down conformation, this is, this is what it looks like from the side in the down conformation. You can see that this blue area here is mostly hidden and in the up conformation it's exposed. So it really sort of, one, it explains one reason why it has to undergo this transition because otherwise this, uh, you know, this, this bit that needs to bind ACE2 is basically hidden. Um, and we can do all sorts of things like analyze uh, principal components and we can um, also look at solvent accessible surface area, which is interesting and useful for therapeutic design as well for understanding different uh, potential efficacies for vaccine candidates. Um, and then the other thing that we found was that actually, in addition to acting like a shield, these glycans uh, also seem to participate in the actual weaponry itself. And we, um, we became interested in two particular glycans, which is N165 and N234, which we noticed when the RBD was in the up conformation, basically stuck underneath this domain and almost like a kickstand helped to keep it propped up. And so we created the in silico mutations of these two sites by mutating them to alanine. And then our, we have we uh, formed a great collaboration with Jason McClellan at UT Austin. He was actually the group, his group was the one that came with the first SARS-CoV-2 structure back in March. It was published, released in the archive in February. They did bilayer interferometry experiments and actually sort of that um, supported our hypothesis and what we saw in the simulations that actually these two particular glycans do affect the ability of the spike to, uh, to, to interact with ACE2. Um, and then this is just um, another movie. This should be a movie. Um, 
uh, where you can sort of see in the dynamics in the up confirmation how these two glycans are actually really propping, propping up that domain. So um, this work has recently uh, been accepted for publication. It's been in the archive for some time while we were waiting for experimental validation, um, but it, I think it's gonna probably go to press next week. Um, and then I'll just say in the last minute, since then what we've been doing in a collaboration with Lillian Chong, um, we've been working with the weighted ensemble method, which is, um, it's a way of basically um, using many short simulations and some clever sort of, in some sense, reweighting schemes to, um, to sort of accelerate sampling without a bias. And so um, we have created, I mean, I don't have time to go into details, but we've created this weighted ensemble methodology for the spike protein to try to uh, sort of sample this unbiased transition from the open, from the closed to the open state and vice versa. And so the system that we did, we chopped off, we just worked with the spike head, we chopped off all the bits underneath. So it has about 600 million atoms or 600, no, not 600 million, 600,000. Um, which is still the largest system by about an order of magnitude that's been used with the weighted ensemble method. So this was cool. They were excited to test this. We did our initial runs on Comet, um, which was awesome using their, um, their P100 GPUs. And then we've had to extend those initial runs uh, for sampling purposes. We've done that um, on Frontier using NVIDIA V100 GPUs. We've been able to get aggregate sampling of about 100 microseconds of actual simulation time, which in weighted ensemble approaches is probably equivalent to about tens of milliseconds. Um, and the data, I mean, I will say that the, the, the data handling for this particular set of methods is pretty challenging. We, we have at least 40 ter terabytes of data with compression, and that's just the protein throwing away all the water. So it's a tremendous amount of data that we're now sort of uh, going through. Um, so you have to define something that's called a progress coordinate, which is basically just a way of how you sort of watch this transformation happening. We did that with two different uh, two different components, and we've been able to, um, to, to, to actually achieve full unbiased sampling of the pathway. We have um, actually over a dozen of these uh, spontaneous transitions um, going from the closed uh, to the open state, and you can sort of see there uh, sort of it going through the motions. And so we're in the process of analyzing that right now. And then I just want to say, uh, I think almost every person on this call probably signed this, this letter that, um, that we as a community put forth in JSON. Gosh, I don't know when that was. It might have been in April, early April or March. Um, and all of the data that we've been generating, and I know many people have been, has been put onto this uh, wonderful site, uh, this COVID MOLSI site. Uh, and so, Anyway, all of the data that we have will eventually be linked to there. Our spike trajectories and so forth are going up next week. So that's the update from us. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions. I probably also went way over time and I'm sorry if I did. That's okay, thank you for a beautiful presentation. That was awesome. That's uh, some great work, uh, great work. And we actually had the multi uh, people present to us uh, uh, a couple months ago to show us the, 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 their repository um, and-, and Good. The, yeah, so it's a, yeah, really nice. Thank you very much. Do we have any qu uh, quick questions for Rami? It's Rami, right? Not Romy. It's it, Romy. It's Romy. Romy. <laughs> I, I hate it's, mispronouncing people's names, which makes it okay. very difficult, but I will remember to say Romy. Any questions? Yeah, because, yeah, it's got the two M's, so everybody wants to say it's a short O, but it's a long O, but you can got blame it. my mom. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? Or, you know, I'm always available for uh, questions afterwards. So, I have a question about, oh, yeah, so this is Bob, Bob Sinkris in San Diego. Hey, Romy, great talk as always. Bob. A quick question about the glycosylation. At a, at, at a particular glycosylation site, is it always the same glycan or can there be variation in what's linked at that site? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. So there can be variation. So this is one of the really interesting things about glycans is that um, they're complicated. And so uh, they're, each glycan site has a different propensity to be the same or different, you know, or it has a certain profile. 
Um, and so some of the sites, in particular, like some of the sites that we mutated are really highly conserved and like there's always either a, a, a one particular type of lichen. So other sites are more variable. So what we did when we set our simulations up is try to obey those experimental constraints as best as we can. And um, so if there was a propensity for a particular site to have some variation, our way of handling that was to, because um, the spike protein is a homo trimer. So it's got three of the sort, sort of, it's got these three 1000 some odd residue segments. We basically, so, so there were basically three copies of each glycosylated site in the single protein. And so for sites that had a lot of variation, we built in different glycans that still obey these experimental sort of constraints, but um, with some variation in each of the copies. Does that make sense? Or in each of the, each of the um, things? Ab absolutely. Wow. So this goes from being a hard problem to a really, really hard problem when you take it. <laughs> That's why we yeah. have the computers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, the computers definitely help with this. Uh, yeah, and just one needs to be a little bit careful with exactly sort of uh, how you analyze and, you know, sort of the claims that you make based on the system that you construct. But, um, you know, that's the other reason why it's actually really good to have multiple models. You know, I know uh, Gerhard Humer has created a model of the spike that's beautiful um, that was published in Science recently, and they have a slightly different profile than ours. And I think, at the, you know, there are probably many groups that have these types of uh, differences in the models. And now that we're sort of, we can all collectively look at and learn from this data, which is, I think, going to maybe hopefully also be important. Great, thank you. I have a question, Rami, about when, like, what's known about when these glycosylations and, and acylations occur? And, um, and where, and is it in the cell or apoplastically or? I think it's as it's coming off of the ER, that it's happening sort of in concert with folding, um, is my understanding for most of these post-translational modifications. Are people looking at using some kind of therapy that alters that? Um, you know, that I know there, so there are, I mean, I would say that the, the whole field, the field of glycan scientists, glycochemists and glycobiologists is, is terrific. Um, you know, there are limitations, I think, potentially to what we could do there because a lot of our own endogenous proteins need to be glycosylated and so forth. So it becomes this challenge of, you know, being able to modulate and manipulate the glycan profile of the virus without affecting what we need for our own ongoing health. Uh, so that challenge will be there. Which is really true about any medicine, just about. That's uh, true, that's, that's hate, true, but, I hate oh, sorry, yeah, we got to short, just because we have three more people that like give updates and I want to the time, but no, 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 no apologies <laughs> necessary, but uh, uh, thank you, Romy, for a great presentation. I'll, I'll turn over to, um, uh, do you have the list, Mate? Do you already need me? Yeah, I do it. So, okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Matei to introduce our next couple speakers. Yeah, so the next speaker is Vangelis uh, Daskalakis from University of Cyprus. Please, Vangelis. Oh, hi. Hello. Good Hello. afternoon. It's uh, actually Cyprus University of Technology, not University of Cyprus, but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, you don't see me, but okay, I'll uh, share my screen now just for the update. Okay. So uh, our uh, project uh, is uh, the dynamics of mutated uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins at all atom resolution and in search uh, for natural product based antivirals and uh, vaccine epitopes. So um, I'll show you some things we have uh, uh, found uh, up to now and what we've done so far. Uh, the team is uh, from Cyprus University of Technology, myself, and uh, University of Crete, um, uh, Professor Elias Castanas, uh, Mr. Athanasios Panagiotopoulos, Professor George Survinos, uh, Mrs. Danai Kozabasi, and from uh, the University of Crete and the Department of uh, Biology, Professor Sterios uh, Pirinzos. So we collaborate on this uh, project. Uh, so uh, these are uh, the SARS-CoV-2 proteins. Uh, up to now, we have uh, concentrated our efforts to the 
3CL Pro, the proteinase of the main proteinase of the virus, uh, which cleaves the polyprotein into 11 different functional proteins. Um, uh, it's a dimer. There is a mistake here. It doesn't bind to importance. That's the next protein that it's by, it binds to importance, the nucleocapsid protein. That's our next target which binds to importins and packs and imports SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA into the host cell uh, nucleus. So these, are, these were our uh, targets so far. Um, uh, we have focused on MPRO and nucleocapsid. We have screened a large database of natural products to find potential uh, functional inhibitors. Uh, we identified important protein domains associated with essential or biologically relevant protein motions and uh, these dark ta uh, drug tra targets. And we explored the conformational landscape of these proteins in regards to the interaction with the drugs that inhibit their function. So uh, the methods where we have uh, employed is uh, a docking, and the screening of natural product database uh, to find uh, potential drug um, uh, candidates, uh, their drug ability and pharmacokinetics. Uh, with, um, and uh, then we run uh, long scale molecular dynamic simulations. We did uh, analyze the results by Markov state modeling. We identified the conformational phase space variables based on a method called time structure independent component analysis, which finds the slowest motions in a protein. So it uses a rather short uh, and multiple short trajectories in, uh, of the protein and uh, extrapolates uh, their long time scale uh, behavior. We employed also parallel temperature metadynamics at the World Temperate Ensemble to see the conformational landscape of these proteins in the presence of uh, the drug. And also we um, uh, searched uh, the sources and uh, the bioavailability of these natural products that were uh, identified as potential candidates uh, against uh, the function of these proteins. So this is the nucleocapsid protein. This it looks like this. We found that a certain uh, natural product called uh, P. Simon uh, can uh, interact with this domain here, the C-terminal domain. Uh, important residues in the interaction are all these listed here. Uh, then the same thing happened with uh, the 3CL Pro, the main proteinase of the virus. And we found that uh, a certain natural product called uh, fortunilin, which is found in a certain fruit called kumquat, uh, is also a potent uh, drug candidate against dimerization, dimerization of uh, this protein. Uh, I list the mommy residues that are uh, important for this interaction. And uh, the red ones are also important for dimer dimerization. This uh, list of amino acids usually is not mutated so far because uh, usually in this domain mutations are found in uh, residues like 45, 46, 47 and 50, which are not listed here as important residues for the interaction with our drug candidate. Uh, now um, I'll focus the rest of this, uh, the, the talk on this main proteinase and the uh, put some details on uh, this data I show you here. Uh, this is where uh, for tunneling docks, it's not on the dimerization interface. However, it affects this dimerization interface. Uh, what we have uh, come, came up is that, uh, okay, the binding of for tunneling weakens the dimerization cross-section of uh, MPRO. Uh, actually, uh, the interactions between these residues here uh, which belong to the cross-section of uh, the, for, uh, the dimer of MPRO. Uh, we, uh, we have found the um, protein landscape uh, and we found that uh, there are actually roughly three minima uh, in the um, landscape. 
Uh, we identified this C1 minimum, which is close to the crystal structure and the dimer-dimer interface uh, has a distance of like 1.7, 1.2 angstrom. But if we go to these two minima here, then the interface is weakened and so we go to up to 1.93 distance between the two. So um, we found out that um, the protein can uh, move between these two these three minima. This is a structure of fortunilin. Uh, it's, it binds uh, some, it binds here, as I showed you also earlier. There is also the, the same surface here, but uh, with the dynamics without fortunilin and the surface without fortunilin in, in the place of, and the presence of fortunilin, we see that we miss the C1 minima, which is uh, the base, the, the active actually form of the protein. It, it has shifted somewhere here. So we found out that in the presence of fortunilin, we miss this minima here, which is important to give the active, um, uh, the active uh, conformation of the protein. Actually also we found out that um, uh, the times between, uh, the transition times between all these minima here are, uh, if we have no fortunilin, all uh, are going with uh, short times towards the first minima, which is the dimerization of the conformation of the dimerization of the protein. But, sorry, in the presence of fortunilin, all times are uh, the protein samples all three minima without actually being trapped in the active one minimum. Uh, so um, the same um, uh, the same method has been used for the nucleocapsid protein. The results are under uh, still under analysis and uh, uh, comparison with experiment experiments. So I won't show much of these. And so we're running the same method on the nucleocapsid protein and the drug candidate uh, P. Simon. Uh, to see how uh, it affects dimerization of the nucleocapsid protein and the interaction with importins, which is important uh, for the function of the protein. Uh, we're looking also at the effects of mutations and drug binding on this protein and the search for epitopes based on the important uh, domains that are exposed uh, in um, certain uh, antigens. Uh, in uh, antibodies. Uh, so that was it. Thank you very much. Uh, that's that were that's that's our results so far. And I hope uh, we have a preprint publication and submitted also for uh, publication Thank based you. on the dynamics of MPRO. So, thanks. Any questions? So this you put on the preprint server already on, or you intend to do that? No, no, it's already there. It's already there. Yes. Ah, okay, yeah, that's cool. great. Mm -hmm. So if there are not, no other questions, uh, we can instead put the question to the chat and we move on yeah. because we are somehow in a hurry. Uh, we have almost, okay. uh, just I forgot, we have almost 90 microseconds of enhanced sampling uh, simulations on NPRO. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you didn't encounter any problems? Uh, with the NPRO, no. With the nuclear capsid, yes. It's a little bit, uh, it's a huge protein, so we have to unsample all the parts of the protein and all that. Uh -huh. But we're still working on it, yes. Right. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, let's move forward. Uh, so the next speaker is uh, Francesco Gervasio. He recently moved from UCL to University of Geneva. I think that I'm right now. Hi, I'm Francesco. Uh, yes, no, I'm still a professor at University College London. So yes, now I'm professor. In London, uh, Professor of Chemistry and Ingeniera, Professor of uh, Pharmaceutical Chemistry. So today I have uh, two updates about two different projects. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Okay. I hope you can uh, see it. Uh, this is not, uh, well, um, 
start the presentation right and okay this should be fine i hope you can see it mm -hmm. so basically the first part uh, it's about uh, uh, targeting the interface between uh, the spike uh, and the uh, ACE2, which is uh, one of the main protein uh, that uh, the, the virus uh, uses to enter the cells. So this is a uh, um, collaboration uh, with uh, various people, uh, in particular my, with my colleague Schotze Beider and uh, Fleming Hansen, who uh, will do the NMR, but also with uh, Stefano Piana and Michael Levine from this show. DeepMind uh, and various experimentalists. So what's the idea? So you've seen in uh, the beautiful movies uh, from Romy that basically when uh, the spike is in uh, this uh, up conformation uh, part of it, which is this green fragment, uh, this is a movie from an actual simulation uh, that was put, uh, made available by this show research, uh, interacts uh, with the ACE2 receptor. So our idea, and uh, we started with this uh, several months uh, ago, was to extract uh, the main uh, helix uh, at the interface uh, with uh, the spike, with uh, the binding part of the spike, uh, stabilize it, uh, so try several uh, designs, uh, and to have something that binds uh, potently to the spike. Why do we want to do this? Well, you know that there are several antibodies that are being uh, developed uh, for the spike. The problem with antibodies is that they are large, they are not very stable, and they have a few binding sites uh, uh, compared to the very large weight. Moreover, they can also uh, lead to adverse uh, antibody triggered effects. Uh, so the idea is that if we have uh, uh, small peptides, uh, this might be a better way to, to, to block the, the viral uh, infectiousness, but also this could be a very nice tool uh, to uh, basically um, join together with nanoparticles uh, for, for deliveries of uh, other drugs. Um, so our approach for this, uh, and this started with uh, Schotter Bider, my colleague at UCL, and my student uh, Yanis Galgadas, uh, was to look at this interface and start first uh, taking these uh, two helix helices and a small helix in the back, uh, and rationally, try to rationally design uh, a better binding. So we consider constructs with our, which are three helices uh, or two helices. And uh, um, we use two different methodologies. Uh, so one was to just extract uh, the wild type uh, helices and use uh, systematic uh, free energy calculation. And this is with, uh, with a nice new uh, methodology developed by Michael Levine at uh, tissue research to systematically stabilize uh, the, the interface. And also add some uh, um, further um, stabilization at the interface between the, the, two, the two helices. The other approach was based on machine learning, and this was by using AlphaFold uh, together with DeepMind, and was to basically redesign the um, scaffold, but then again use uh, free energy uh, calculation, and I, I mean by this by alchemical uh, calculation to uh, basically calculate the different uh, the, the difference in the free energy of uh, binding. So the idea is to try to do this uh, rationally. And it's a different approach from uh, what was uh, taken by Baker's lab. I don't know if you have seen uh, the, the recent preprint. Uh, they had uh, potent uh, peptides, but their approach uh, basically led to the screening by um, East uh, uh, screening of 100,000 uh, peptides. And of this 100,000, three scaffolds were, uh, were successful. So our, our idea was to do this uh, in a more rational and more targeted way if and which would be complementary. So uh, first uh, we, we did some uh, stability analysis by doing very long uh, simulation with, uh, with different force field. So a different force field, I mean uh, uh, here, uh, Charm 36M or uh, Desamber. And these are, these are the helices uh, directly extracted from uh, the, the uh, two receptor. Problem is that even uh, in, in a few uh, tens of microseconds, this starts uh, unfolding. So one design uh, that uh, we tried with uh, my talented student, Yanis uh, Galdadas, was to add uh, a disulfide bridge here to 
try to stabilize it and I will show you some experimental results. Uh, this stabilizes it, but still, if you look at the root mean square deviation at some point, uh, the uh, loose end uh, basically uh, unfold. Or, and this is a completely, this is let's say the other end of the spectrum, uh, and, and this is a, um, a completely redesigned uh, a scaffold uh, by using alpha fold. So this uh, simulation were done in collaboration with my colleague. Once uh, we did this simulation, we took uh, the best uh, design with uh, uh, my, my postdoc uh, Ladislav uh, Ovan shown here, and we calculated the, 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 the folding free energy landscape. So what are these simulations? The simulation are multiple replica metadynamic simulations. So we have six replicas with two collective variables that in other uh, peptide cases uh, were shown to, to, to work. One is the distance from the native content map and the other one it's uh, the content, alpha helical content. And you can already see uh, as uh, basically was hinted by the long uh, MD simulations uh, that uh, if you look at the original peptide, this is the two helices and the small back helix, which call, we call the A1, A2, A3. So basically this is a wild type uh, peptide directly extracted from maize. You see that basically it tends to unfold, um, basically the, the, the unfolded and folded state almost have the same free energy, but also uh, some states which uh, lose uh, the helicity are populated. While some of the design where we stabilize the back one have a much deeper uh, folded uh, state, free energy state, for the folded state. So um, we started doing uh, experiments. And, and uh, well, this is where our enthusiasm has been a little bit uh, um, uh, quenched because <laughs> Uh, it turns out that the best peptides that, uh, that we designed were, are extremely difficult uh, to express. Even though we uh, basically uh, used uh, um, machine learning based uh, prediction for the um, solubility of, of these peptides, uh, it, ter it turns that many of the design are extremely toxic uh, for, uh, for E. coli and basically they cannot uh, be expressed. But a few could be expressed and we have here the few that uh, could be expressed uh, so far are those that were predicted to be uh, not very uh, stable. And in fact, if you look at the circular dichroism, you see that uh, the percentage of uh, helix, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, very high. Uh, basically, it's around up to 20%. Interestingly, when we look at the binding to the spike by ELISA test, they seem to bind very potently. So we think there is something that is not really uh, right about this ELISA test. In fact, now we're trying to do calorimetry on this uh, and uh, the newer uh, designs. Because probably in, uh, in, the, in the ELISA wells, uh, there is a, an effect of crowding that, that makes uh, these uh, peptides more helical than they should be. And so they tend to bind much more than they should really bind. So this is why we really want to do calorimetry and NMR with my colleague uh, Fleming. So I would say uh, this is, uh, well, considering that we didn't test and we don't have the means to test 100,000 uh, designs, uh, we're doing reasonable progress with this. And, uh, and now we are more and more using the free energy calculation to optimize uh, uh, the stability and uh, the, uh, basically the interface. The second part uh, of uh, which is uh, pertains to a, a different uh, uh, project is about targeting this uh, no structural uh, uh, protein one. Structural protein one uh, it's uh, not one of uh, the, the targets that are uh, uh, targeted by many groups uh, because it's, it's not uh, you know the, the spike or uh, the, 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 the targets that have been early on. Uh, individuated as, as the most uh, interesting. But in reality, we think that this is uh, very interesting. It has been shown that this is uh, a, ma a major virulence and pathogenicity factor. And interestingly, it binds to the 40S ribosome to inactivate uh, the translation. And basically this blocks, uh, this increases the translation, the expression of viral genes and blocks uh, the host immune response. So this 
target could be interesting to use, uh, for instance, in a combination uh, um, viral uh, therapy. And SP1, but, but it, it's really difficult to, to target because the, the compact and well-folded part uh, apparently does not have any drug binding pockets. As you can see here, basically, there, there aren't big uh, cavities. Uh, but uh, as uh, some of you know, uh, my group has been studying for a number of years uh, the, the, the way of exposing cryptic binding sites, and this is what we are doing for this target. So what is a cryptic binding site? Cryptic or hidden binding sites are not visible in uh, protein targets crystallized without a ligand. They only become visible when uh, you uh, bind uh, it to, to a ligand. And, but they can provide an interesting alternative uh, uh, to substrate competitive problems. Or in the case of the NSP1, uh, basically where there are no cavities, uh, this is the only um, one of the few approaches that are uh, available for rational uh, design. <coughs> Here I show a few examples of the known cryptic site. This is the 10-1 beta-lactamase, interleukin-1, PLK-1. So we designed a computational approach that, and we worked on several different targets. I will show you in a few slides what is our approach and then the result on, on, COVID, on the COVID target. So if you run a, a simulation of your target, this is the case of 10-1 beta-lactamase, but it's the same for uh, NSP1. If you look at the exposure of the pocket, uh, here it's uh, in a percentage, uh, the water exposure of uh, the um, cavity lining uh, uh, residues. You see that in a long trajectory, this is uh, one microsecond and then several others starting from the final point. Uh, basically the, the cavity for this stem one uh, almost never uh, happens. And this is true with different uh, force field. So we have looked this with, with several different force fields. So uh, if you project this as a violin plot here, basically the violin plot uh, has the, let's say, belly here down where the pocket is closed, so around 20% exposed. So we reasoned that there must be a, an important uh, um, inducive fit effect in this and other, and other targets. Informational selection can be still important, but at least inducive fit uh, plays a role uh, for, for beta-lactamase. So if you run, for instance, uh, in this case, uh, several uh, different uh, trajectories, these are independent uh, molecular dynamic trajectories of 100 nanoseconds each, without, uh, with just pure water, uh, the cavity never opens. If you have benzene, in some of these cases, it opens up, and if you do, one microsecond long uh, simulation with benzene, you see that in several of these independent runs, uh, you see the opening of the cavity for beta-lactamase. So there is some induced fit effect. So our reasoning was to develop this uh, swish uh, Hamiltonian replica exchange, which is sampling water interfaces through scaled Hamiltonians. So basically we uh, have an Hamiltonian replica exchange where the difference between the different replicas is in the interaction between water and uh, the hydrophobic residues uh, of uh, the target. By doing this, uh, by progressively scaling this non-bonded interaction, if you apply this uh, to, uh, to all these known uh, cryptic sites harboring uh, protein, you see that uh, high scaling, uh, almost always you expose the, the cavity. And then if you combine this with mixed solvent like benzene or heteroaromatic, you always expose the cavity. So the idea here is to add swish to open the cavity and the mixed solvent to stabilize it. So to have both induced fit and conformational selection. This worked in all the cases which we have thrown at it, uh, including complicated cases like Neiman Pick uh, type 2, C2 receptor or uh, uh, many, many of the, the ones that are known. So we endeavored to do this on NSP1 and these are the results. These are very uh, novel. Basically, uh, a cavity where there was no cavity, it's visible when we use a swish with this uh, benzene mixed solvent. And the interesting thing is that there are several anchoring points uh, which uh, can be used either to uh, form specific uh, and directional interactions so for the design of ligands that are specific. Or even, uh, and this is something that we are doing in collaboration with groups in California, 
to do a covalent binding. So this is where we are at. So now we are really waiting for the experiment. And I have to thank the people from the, my group, in particular uh, Silvia, and Carol, uh, and Ladislav, uh, Yannis uh, for uh, the peptide binding, uh, Shozeb for uh, the collaboration, and, uh, and then we have uh, uh, also Francesca, uh, postdoc in Geneva, and Alberto for the NSP1. And uh, thank you for your attention. Great, thanks. Thanks, Francesca. Um, I think in the interest of time, we may just forego questions because we have one more presentation and we're, we're already over uh, over time, if that's okay. But you're welcome to continue the discussion on our Slack channel and uh, ask questions in the chat window if you're, sure. if you're okay. Thank you for a very beautiful presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, our final speaker today will be Sandro, ba Sandro Bataro. Bataro, I think. I got it right, right? <laughs> So uh, go ahead, uh, take it away, Sandra. Hi, can you can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. I uh, know just. So uh, I will tell a little bit about what you're doing from the RNA side of COVID, and um, so the SARS-CoV-2 genome is about 30 kilobits long, and it's a single-stranded RNA, and at the five prime end and the three prime end of the genome, you have two untranslated uh, regions. And these regions are short compared to the rest of you know, the genome, but they're involved in replication, transcription, and packaging. And it has been shown that if you, you, well, if you mutate uh, some of uh, uh, these regions and affect the stability of the UTR, that affects viral replication. So that's sort of why people have been uh, looking at, at uh, these two regions, and here on the left you can see the five prime end UTR, and on the right you have three prime end UTR, and it is known to contain structural, conserved structural motifs, and those are mostly stem loops. SL1 is stem stands for stem loop one, stem loop two, and and so on and so forth. The secondary structure of some of these is known, and it is also known that some of these elements they fold independently. And this is mostly known from uh, SARS-CoV-1. And in fact, there are only two uh, PDB structures from the, the uh, non-coding regions here. And one is located here, this SO2. And the second one is this apical loop at S2M. And these are you know, almost completely conserved also in SARS-CoV-2. So given their importance, people have been starting looking at, at it and saying, well, what is the structure of these elements? And uh, maybe some parts are not structured at all. Uh, they are known some, somehow to bind to proteins. How? Uh, that's, that's all unclear. Uh, so this is some of the questions that we are addressing as a part of this consortium, which is called uh, COVID-19 NMR. And essentially, uh, most of the people are uh, NMR experimentalists. And uh, we're doing some uh, modeling of some individual elements. And here uh, I will just uh, show you some of the results we obtained looking at one of them, which is SL2. And it's this short stem loop here. And we chose it because it's relatively simple. And there exists PDB with the same loop sequence. So there's a little bit of structural data uh, already available. Uh, as I said before, uh, there is no, uh, in general, we, don't, we do not expect to have structural data at all. So we need a, well, a starting confirmation at least. And given that the secondary structure of this RNA is known, then we came up with this uh, uh, simple procedure by which essentially we start an MD simulation for a completely extended elongated confirmation. And then we generate an A form RNA template, and then we simply pull. So we do it many, many times, and essentially what happens is that we can end up with a, uh, a pool of structures, and uh, this pool of structure, they have the same, the same stem conformation, more or less, but a different loop. As I mentioned before, in this case, we do have a PDB to look at, and in the PDB, we have this interaction between these two. 
And one question that you can ask is that, well, is the structure somehow in this bundle? And here the figure is a bit messy, so you can look at this on, a, on this uh, plane, where essentially on the x-axis you have the distance from the PDB, and on the y-axis you have the distance between these two bases, so C7 and G10. An important thing to see here is that, well, all the PDB like structure, they should be around here, but all, all our pooling structures are essentially somewhere else. So we said, well, perhaps it's a, it's, it's a problem of sampling and therefore uh, we need to sample more. So we resample essentially only the um, loop region and we do so by using essentially par partial tempering uh, where you have two regions, one, one cold and one hot, and in the hot region, uh, you accelerate the sampling by, uh, by um, increasing the temperature. And then you do it in such a way that you have one unbiased replica where you can collect uh, uh, um, statistics. So the resulting, the result of this procedure is, is essentially a free energy landscape. And here you can see, you know, it's rather different from what you can see from the red. And the most important thing to see here is that you have one global minimum free energy located here, and it roughly corresponds to this structure, which is remarkably similar to the one you would expect uh, from, from experiment. And this might seem you know, a trivial result, but it is not because you know, RNA force fields are known not to be um, accurate or it's debated. So, uh, I was also surprised to see this, this result, which is, I think it's very encouraging. So uh, what we're doing now is that we're moving to more complex systems. And um, uh, this is one of them. This is SL5A, which has two, uh, uh, two helices. And we're also running some tests on, on other model system just to make sure that the procedure that we're uh, 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 developing is, 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 is robust. Uh, well, in essence, of our goal in some sense is to come up with an MD-based procedure to help experimental structure determination. And the first step, we generate 3D structure with a given secondary structure. Then we try to do exhaustive sampling of the flexible regions. And uh, the other thing we would like to do, actually, we're planning to do is to integrate the NMR data we get from the consortium together with the MD a posteriori using our um, well, reweighting uh, method. And also in some sense, the output of all these steps is different conformational ensemble, uh, which of course, you know, the more, you know, each step is more and more and more difficult or, or take more time uh, and data, but then in principle, they should be also more accurate. Um, uh, the goal, which is not something we're working on at the moment, but uh, this is one of the final goal is the chance essentially that uh, when, one, once we have this ensemble, we can do ensemble based uh, drug design. And uh, with this, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Preston, who's, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, we're working together with him and we're also working together with uh, Giovanni Bussi from CISA that helped us setting up the simulations. And thank you all for staying uh, here with me. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you very much for coming and uh, giving us an update. That was really great. Um, any, uh, again, if there are any questions, I think in the interest of time, uh, feel free to uh, engage on the uh, Slack channel and uh, uh, continue the discussion. Uh, I want to thank all of our speakers for uh, giving us a, a great updates, all, all the great updates today. This was really wonderful. And I already see people passing emails in the in the uh, zoom chat trying to, uh, to, to to talk about the the uh, the research uh, after the fact so that's that's great our next webinar will be on I believe October 8th uh, I already know that we'll be getting an update from Ola Saisea from CMU about his work and we'll be looking for other contributions if anybody would like to give a uh, presentation so thank you all very much for joining and please stay safe and have a great uh, a great September Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.